Well, welcome Towson University alumni, faculty, staff, and friends. I'm Jenna Mills, the Director of Alumni Engagement Programs and a proud 2009 and 2016 graduate of Towson University. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar, Artificial Intelligence in the Workplace. Joining me today from the TU Alumni Relations team to help with this presentation is Steve Rosenfeld, Director of Alumni Communication and Recognition. Today, we have alumni from 1975 to 2020 and even some of our soon to be newest Tiger grads joining us from states like Delaware, Maryland, New York, Pennsylvania, South Carolina and Texas. Before I introduce today's guests, I do want to share a few housekeeping notes. This session is being recorded and we will share it with all registrants when it is finalized. Please just be patient with us. This process does take a few weeks as we do add closed captions before adding it to our YouTube channel. Attendees will remain muted throughout the discussion, but we'd love to hear from you. So please use the chat function in your window uh, and pose your questions to all attendees today. I'd now like to introduce Tim Kalp. Tim is the Chief Innovation Officer at Mind Over Machine. As the fourth industrial revolution transforms businesses, Tim helps companies and their workforces use automation to grow. He enables businesses to increase their human value with his liberal arts education and passion for artificial intelligence. With years on the front lines of automation, Tim leads workers and business leaders to realize the potential of human plus machine future instead of the human versus machine future. Tim earned his Master of Science in Applied Information and a Post-Baccalaureate Certificate in Information Security from Towson University in 2012. Tim, thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar. Thank you for having me today. All right, let's get into it. So the topic for today is AI careers. And so fundamentally, anytime we're thinking about careers, we're talking about skills. And so I want to share with you just where I actually share, though, that was the uh, that was the funny part. The jokes don't get any better. So I uh, hope you're enjoying them. Uh, so sharing with you the slide deck, which you should be able to see here. One of the core things I want you to take away from our discussion today is you do not have to be a coder or developer or engineer for a career in artificial intelligence. Yes, these are very needed jobs. There's high demand for these jobs, but these aren't the only jobs out there for the artificial intelligence age. There's a lot that all kinds of jobs are gonna be needed for artificial intelligence in the future. And so in today's discussion, we're gonna talk about some of those transformations that have happened uh, and where your skills could fit in or where you could focus to grow new skills. Fundamentally, artificial intelligence is everywhere. So you are surrounded by it constantly, whether it is Google just listening to you all the time to wait for your next request, or if it's Siri ready to tell you the weather or Alexa, um, not to mention just you know, sensors around us that are being built into everything to prepare for self-driving cars. And so some cars have the ability to detect when you're getting too close or they have the light up things on the rear view windows to say, hey, a car is getting near you. These are all sensors preparing for this artificial intelligence world. And so as we move forward, there's a lot of careers outside of STEM and tech. Um, and I, I like the visual of thinking about this in doors. You have lots of different doors that you can use for your career and when you think about the school that you are doing or what did you study at your time at Towson or in your you know undergrad or your graduate or high school or hobbies that you have there's all kinds of doors it's not just the data science door that is available for artificial intelligence all the doors are needed fundamentally AI will become as common as a pencil like we, one of my favorite quotes from Douglas Adams is technology will only be useful when it's like a pack of pencils. I can open the pack, I take a pencil out, I start writing and I know how to use it. I don't need training. I don't need a manual. I just, I know how to use it. I'd encourage you to reflect on the last time you bought a smartphone. Was the experience similar? And so, you know, with it, with an iPhone, uh, this is not an advertisement for iPhones, but with an iPhone, it is a very similar experience where you have, uh, you open up the package. Usually the store person is configuring you to the network. They hand you your phone. It's ready for you to use. AI will be there shortly. Um, that 
it is just going to be around. It's going to be available for every job and it's going to be just like a pencil. It's going to be very, very useful. So I'm Tim Kulp. Uh, Jenna introduced me already. Uh, just a quick word on Mind Over Machines. So we are a technology consulting firm. We help businesses solve business problems with technology. Those problems could be like implementing CRM systems. They could be rethinking how the workforce is designed because of the disruption artificial intelligence and automation are making. So everything from strategy to implementation, we cover it all at Mind Over Machines. Automation is a time of opportunity. So we're entering into uh, what the World Economic Forum calls the fourth industrial revolution. And the key thing about the fourth industrial revolution, and you'll hear uh, Microsoft talks about this a lot lately in their uh, recent announcements from Ignite, their big uh, tech conference, is it's atoms and bits. You know, so the real world, in the digital world, working together for common outcomes. We at Mind Over Machines, we talk about it as human plus digital um, and thinking about how do you do more with human plus digital. Um, and we think about jobs of the future. And so we're going to rewind in time. Jobs of the future, like a farmer in the early 1900s. And so you think about the skills of a farmer in the early 1900s. Um, physical strength, super important. Um, working with simple machines, like we're seeing here, very important. It was small plots of land with a diversified crop. You know, so lots of different crops, small plots of land. We flat, you know, fast forward here and we get to industrialization in farming. And so the skills that this person has, you know, pushing the device here are a little different than the skills this person has inside of the tractor. And so if you were to say, okay, person in white shirt, I need you to climb into this tractor and do the same job. They would just kind of look at you like, uh, I don't know. Reflect on where your career is currently because we're at an industrial revolution's beginning. So this is the equivalent of finance where we are today with spreadsheets they're amazing calculators they're amazing artificial intelligence will transform accounting from the version of accounting of this to this where we are industrialized we can do more we can specialize because now think about this farmer's skills they're working with complex machines the tractor is a lot more complex than you know the device hooked up to the animals um working with less people covering more land and uh, which has created a change in the crop so it's actually very specialized crop now where in the early 1900s is very diversified crop nowadays getting into the late 20th, uh, 20th century it's very specialized crops and farms why did all this happen because the technology enabled it to happen and so when we think about job loss and job displacement, what we're talking about is thinking about farming changing from this guy to this guy. It's not that jobs will just disappear overnight. Skills for the fourth industrial revolution. So just in general, AI job or not, this whole digital plus human, you know, there's core skills, no matter what your career is you wanna go to. One is constant learner. And one of the key words in this statement is be intentional on your learning. Don't just kind of wander through life and see what happens, you know, be intentional on your learning. So most learning is on the job training. What are you learning on the job? Like, what are you learning through your work today? And if you say nothing, that is a great indicator of maybe it's time to move on or you're not thinking hard enough about what you're learning. So be intentional about what you're learning. Creativity. Um, whenever I say this, I always get an eye roll from at least one person. I can't see you guys, so I'm assuming somebody eye rolled, I'm sure. Um, but this doesn't mean that you can draw or sculpt or paint. No, creativity is taking idea A and idea B and coming up with idea C. That's just like humans can just do that. We're really good at that. 
And so what I would say is reflect on your creativity. What do you, how do you manifest creativity in your work? And again, if the answer is I don't, take a moment to reflect on, well, how could I? You know, what, what are the creative things that I could be doing? Finally, problem reduction. There are some really big problems in the world. We have many, many big problems. Problem reduction uh, is actually from artificial intelligence in the mid 20th century. We talked about um, the key capability of artificial intelligence was problem reduction. Big problem, break it down into smaller parts and then have the smaller parts be what you focus on. Because if you try to solve the big problem, it just seems like it's a boulder you can't push. But if you start focusing on the smaller problems to resolve out the bigger problem, this is key. So as we think about the more and more complex nature of work and problems and the challenges we face, problem reduction is going to be a really fundamental skill. So I was going to use Slido for our presentation today, but Slido had some issues that I couldn't work through this morning. So what I'd say is have a piece of paper handy. Um, I am a big advocate of always having a Sharpie, a pencil, and some paper handy to jot down some notes. What I'd encourage you to jot down for yourself right now is how do you do these things today? How are you a constant learner? How are you being creative? How are you using problem reduction? And reflect on, are you? And if you're not, why not? So feel free to post in the chat. If uh, you have some thoughts there, we'd love to hear from you. And Jenna, if you don't mind keeping an eye on the chat, the chat window has disappeared as I'm sharing, so. No problem. Thank you. All right. So World Economic Forum, uh, they have a lot of great content about the fourth industrial revolution. I highly recommend going and checking it out. Um, some really good podcasts. Um, and one of those podcasts is called The Great Reset. COVID-19 uh, disrupted everything about work, school, our relationship with each other, our relationship with uh, the planet and with our students and with how we think about work, um, transitioning from work as a place to work as an activity um, at a huge scale, transitioning to working from home versus an office or not having a commute anymore and you know the psychological impact of not having a commute. It's fascinating to see what has happened here. But also, remember, in this section, we talked about automation and opportunity. The Great Reset is a great opportunity for you to rethink who you are in the workforce, the skills that you use in your work, and what are the skills that you want to grow and, and amplify. You know, so everybody goes home to, to work, not everybody, but many, many people. Um, I think it was, I saw a recent Microsoft survey, it was like 60% of knowledge workers, you know, when, uh, immediately to work from home last March. And now people are starting to trickle back into the office, um, little at a time. It's the hybrid office concept. And so when you come back, you're going to hear comments like, oh, you look different, or oh, you know, your hair, it's grayer. You know, <laughs> that's what I'll hear. Um, but you'll hear these comments about how you've changed. Embrace that. Be, yes, I've changed. I've learned these new skills and I'm really excited about bringing them to our company. So reflect on how you can use the Great Reset to your career advantage. Now, let's talk about specifically AI careers. Uh, and when I say AI career, what do I mean? So there's, there's a couple ways to answer that question. There are creators. So the people who are actually creating the AI systems and so, you know, also known as the machine, um, although that sounds really ominous. So the creators are the, these are the programmers who are building the algorithms to be working with and for you to code with. Um, but these are also people who are using tools like Azure ML, uh, which is a no code or low code platform to be able to build your own machine learning algorithms. These are people that are creating the, the tools for you to tie into to work in an AI workforce environment. So for instance, if you think about Excel, Microsoft Excel, 
That is a tool that was created by Microsoft. Microsoft's the creators. Microsoft has a whole bunch of engineers who are creating Excel. If you're working in accounting, you're probably using Excel. Like you're probably doing something inside of spreadsheets, maybe Excel, maybe G Suite, whatever your office tool of choice. Well, you're a consumer of that product. You are working with that tool. So what is happening is there's a third group showing up here. We're gonna talk about them in a minute. These are people who are not creating the, the raw tool, but they're not just consuming the tools either. It's this middle space. And that's where a lot of opportunity in AI is, is this middle space. There's lots of jobs for creators, uh, so many jobs that they cannot be filled. Um, we do not have the talent pool to fill these technical creator jobs, but there's this middle layer that also cannot be filled right now. Lots of opportunity there. But to start, I say this is the second most important slide, which is why it is labeled as such, is digital confidence. You can't have a mindset of, if I touch it, it's going to break. Um, we, if you want a career in this burgeoning field, and again, I'm, what I'm sharing with you is this is a brand new field, really, from a, from a career perspective. Um, it's get, AI is getting out of academia. It's getting deeper than, you know, uh, experiments and businesses are looking at it as strategic initiatives, not just like, oh, that'll be neat and we can do some PR around that. You know, no, it's real impact that it's making in businesses. So with that, it's new, it's a little bit wild west, things can get broken and you need to have digital confidence, which is not having the fear that you're gonna break and destroy everything to try stuff out. So the first part of digital confidence, you're not gonna break it, whatever it is. And even if you do break it, well, that's a learning opportunity for you to dig in and figure things out. Now, there's a limit on this of, um, I'm talking about tools and you know the software systems you're using. I'm not talking about society. So if you break society, that's a, that's a bad thing. And I point this out because as AI is getting more and more commonplace, algorithms are driving more and more of our life. And so if you create algorithms with baked in bias that create all kinds of social issues, and I think we can think of a couple topics from the last few years where this has happened, um, that's bad. You don't wanna do that. But if you're just looking to implement a tool of, okay, well, how do I predict um, the likelihood of this sales deal closing, you know, reflect on social and societal impacts, experiment with it, see what you can do. But from a technology standpoint, chances are you're not going to irrevocably break something. Explore low code. Digital confidence is best built with low code, where you don't have to put in this huge time commitment to code and be an engineer. You can just click, drag, drop, build tools visually to see how it's gonna work. It's easier to understand uh, from a learner's perspective. You can dig into all the Python you want, and that's great. If you wanna be a AI engineer building algorithms and building you know big data science systems, Python should be on your list of things to learn. Um, but you don't have to start there. You can start with tools like I mentioned earlier, Azure ML, or starting with Power Platform, Power BI. You know, these are all Microsoft tools. They're tools I'm familiar with, um, but there's tons of tools out there that you can select from. The key is start low code, experiment so that you can play, have fun. Don't just make this like dire, oh, I've got to learn this. My career depends on it. And that's a lot of pressure. That's not going to put you in a good learning mindset. So play. Have fun with it. So, uh, Jenna, can we just take a, a quick question from the audience here? If I ask you guys, when I say digital confidence, like, can you, does that make sense to everyone? Or is this a, you know, I don't get it. What, what are we talking about here? Sure. So to everyone who's attending today's webinar, Tim is asking if you understand what the term digital confidence means, or if you've got questions around what this, um, this term 
means to you and in, in your workplace. Uh, we have one question answer that's come through so far and it, and, and she does say that it makes sense that it does. The topic does make sense. Um, I'm waiting to see if anything else comes through our chat. Everyone's agreeing awesome. that it makes sense. Cool. And, and the reason I, I say, let's pause here. Let's check in because if you don't have the digital confidence, well, the rest of this gets kind of shaky along the way. So don't be afraid you're going to break something. Okay. Uh, and, uh, Jenna, I found the chat, so thank you. <laughs> and thanks everyone for not laughing too hard while I was looking for the chat in uh, WebEx here. So moving on, let's talk about citizen developers. Um, this is a job of the future that is going to be massively important and available to many, many people. But you gotta have the digital confidence first. Citizen developers are people who work in a department like finance or HR or you know, operations, and they use the tools approved by IT to develop business solutions. And so as an example, um, I'll use uh, Power Apps as an example. And again, this is not a uh, bias for Microsoft, it's just the tools I'm, I'm most familiar with. You could have somebody in finance who builds a Power App that makes processing invoices easier, simpler. You don't have to copy and paste data around to different systems. You just enter it in this one place and it moves the data to all the necessary places. You don't have to be a developer to build something like that. You can build that as somebody who deeply knows finance and the business processes that are happening. This is where those low code tools could come in and really help you out like that you don't have to be an engineer, you just have to know your business processes. So from a machine learning perspective, which is very much a focus of artificial intelligence now, there are low code tools built into tools, even like Excel, that you can use Microsoft Excel to build out some low code um, machine learning models. So lots of value here, but the citizen developers key importance is they understand the business, they understand the value and the impact. It is not just about the technology. So Ed, I see um, your broader definition. I will provide that um, as we keep going here. You know, the, the way I kind of look at it is um, digital confidence is about not being afraid to pick up some new piece of technology and start experimenting with it. So. If you pause and say to yourself, well, I'm not going to talk to Alexa because I don't know what to say to her. You know, that's a digital confidence thing. A good example of having strong digital confidence would just be you just start talking to Alexa and see what happens. And if you need a really good model of digital confidence, go hang out with some kids that are interacting with smartphones and uh, Alexa's and Siri's and just see they just start interacting. There's not, there is no, sometimes there should be more, but there's not a lot of thought process that goes into, is it going to be able to do this? Um, a good example are um, when I'm talking to, you know, my daughter would ask me a question about her homework and I don't know the answer. In this one case, she immediately turned and said, Alexa, and, and asked the same question and Alexa was able to answer. That's not how, you know, we grew up thinking. That's how they grow up thinking of, there's always a digital assistant listening and ready to answer whenever you need anything. Social impacts, yes, there's impacts here. Um, we don't need to dive into that deeper, but uh, that is a good example of digital confidence. They just go for it. There, there's no like, oh, what should I do? How do I think about it? Just go. Hope that helps, Ed. Okay, um, what AI tools are in Excel? Um, that I will provide, there's an excellent article from Microsoft that outlines all these good things. I will provide that in uh, wrap up materials to share with everyone. Um, social intelligence is a fundamental and super important uh, part of your future in AI. Um, because rarely are you gonna build anything from an AI perspective on your own. You need to get the data from somewhere. Somebody's gonna to need to explain the data to you. You're gonna to need to clean it up, filter it, have other people verifying it. It's gonna be a team effort. 
And so when we think about teams, you know, you've got to have a very high Q, uh, high EQ, um, so the emotional intelligence and high participation. So a recent MIT study was going through and saying, how do you predict a high performing team? And what they found was team members that have extremely high, when you have a majority of the team that has an extremely high emotional intelligence and extremely high participation, you have extremely high performing teams. So translate this, when we say emotional intelligence, how does that manifest? Well, that manifests by, you know, collaboration, by empathy, by communication, and making sure that these things are happening in context to the human situation. Um, there's some challenges to these right now though, right? Cause we're all virtual, like we're still in this kind of virtual limbo of when we're reacting to people. And so you have, uh, you know, a meeting where you have 32 faces on the screen and you're trying to scan all of them from emotional reactions to what you're saying and you can't do it because that's not how our brains work. We wouldn't normally stand in front of 32 people and say things and be scanning for emotional reactions. You don't even see this in people who are used to that kind of a uh, presentation mode. They're presenting to certain groups of people as they are like looking through the audience. So the, we're in kind of a challenge here, but that emotional intelligence, super important. And so honing that, practicing that, really developing your ability to communicate, collaborate, and tap in with empathy, very important skills to work in an AI team. Also recognize that humans usually like humans. Um, so not always, but going through and, you know, why did the AI system do this? you're going to have to explain it like and so as you build out your skills as a um, as a AI career which could be through low code maybe you've built a system that is using robotic process automation you know where a human is kind of clicking through a user interface just like a user or like a human would um, you need to explain why did it make the decisions it made and you need to recognize normally when people are asking you that it's not just for fun and just to chat there's a usually a problem and so your social intelligence is tapping into what is the problem how do you help this person come to ease with the situation and overcome a fear of computers like science fiction media has built into us a terrible fear of the machines and how they're going to take all of our jobs and kill us as terminators and you know all this stuff not the case, but we do have very real social impacts from these machines and very real financial impacts in companies from these machines. And so as an AI ex you know, expert person that you wanna grow into, you've gotta be able to talk to humans about what the machines did and why. And then relating to this, take a look at your social tasks. Like what are the social tasks you do today in your job? So for instance, uh, I like using developers, uh, software developers, as an example for this specific topic because there's a mindset of software developers are just like heads down coders. That is not the case. You have code reviews where you have to get together with your peers and explain what did you do, why did you do it, here's how it worked. You have backlog, you know, prioritization, and you're looking through and saying, okay, well, this user story is worth this many points, and here's why I think that. There's a lot of collaboration that happens to build modern software. So what are you doing to focus on those skills? You know, you as a developer, a lot of times people are like, well, I'm gonna go learn the latest API or I'm gonna go focus on this programming language. But we know the highest performing teams are high EQs and high participation. So how are we focusing on growing those EQ skills? Collaboration, communication, empathy. So focus on where those are and then in your uh, scratch paper, you know, with the pencil, jot down, what are your social tasks? What are those communication, collaboration, empathy tasks that you do every day? Uh, and again, if your answer is, I don't do any, I'd love to hear that. <laughs> like, how, are, how do you go throughout the day without interacting with any humans? Um, if anybody wants to share some of their tasks in the chat, I'd love to hear what you have. So continuing on, um, 
do you need to be a data scientist to work in artificial intelligence? Uh, no, you do not. Um, there is a really good uh, article in Harvard Business Review uh, where they talk about jobs of the future. And they talk about it as the trainer, the explainer, and they say sustainer, I say maintainer, but that's up to you know whichever version of that you want to go with. The trainer is the person who is teaching you know the machine how to do whatever it does. So if it's a chat bot, you're teaching it how to talk to uh, the customers. Like maybe it's a customer service chat bot. It has to be able to talk to the customers. Now I'd like you to reflect on for a moment. Would you like to talk to a chat bot whose conversation was designed by an engineer or by an actor? You know, and you think about that and think about it in context, what's the kind of conversations you have with people who think about engineering problems like an engineer? And what are the kind of conversations you have when you're talking to an actor about a character? Because isn't that that's what a chatbot is? Like it's the character, it's the voice of your brand as a company. So that trainer doesn't have to be a data scientist. In fact, it probably should be an actor. It should be somebody who can portray your company's brand how you want it to be. Explainers, we talked about this uh, previously. Why did the AI system do what it did? What are the business rules that told it to do that? What are the um, reasons in the algorithm? So again, it's, it's not just knowing the business process. You should know something about how the actual technology works but not so much that you can write it, you should just know how it works. Um, why did it make the decisions it made? And then the maintainer or the sustainer is the, the people who keep it running. Like you've got to you know, feed the machine, you know, AI systems, um, they're not coded instructions. It's not like you're just telling the machine, this is what you should do. You're providing it guide rails to say, okay, based on these data points, you should make these decisions like this. So it's, it's guide rails that need to be fed to understand, well, how do I make decisions? How do I keep making accurate decisions? How do I make more accurate decisions? They're not instructions uh, like traditional programming, which is just do this, then do this, and then there's some conditions and do this, this, this. It's a different animal. Um, so the maintainer is an important role as well. This is where your data scientists come in. This is where your programmers come in. This is where um, your DevOps engineers come in to keep the machines healthy, running, fed, you know, care and feeding. So it's important roles. These are very important roles, but they're not the only roles. Understanding your business processes is critical. So again, getting back to the explainer, the person who's saying, well, why did it do what it did? Um, these are probably gonna be the most important people in a company that can articulate, why did the machine do what it did? And how do I articulate that to other people? Uh, because again, you can see the conversations happening. This person was denied a medical claim. Why were they denied a medical claim? Somebody's gonna have to articulate that. And it's not gonna be, uh, the person who's just on the call center phones uh, just reading a log, you know, that's not going to be detailed enough. That's not going to be the, the enough information for somebody who's very emotionally charged about why was my claim de declined. So this is a high EQ role, the explainer, as well as a technical understanding. You know, again, you don't have to be able to build the systems. You just need to know how they work. And then identifying who are you doing this for and why are you doing it? You know, so any of the AI systems that you're building, any AI system you're working with, who's it for and why are you doing it? You know, if you can't answer those two questions, step back, stop what you're doing. So if you're building in uh, Power BI a um, you know, algorithm to show here is you know, uh, how likely this product is to be successful, as an example. Well, who's consuming that data? You know, if you're building it for sales, you're gonna to wanna to tell a different message than if you're building it for operations, you know, because success is measured in totally different ways. So know who you are building your tools for and why are you building it? This is also where I just highlight, you know, don't forget, technology should be for the, in general, well-being of humanity. This is, you know, Tim and Mind Over Machines, our mindset of like, do good in the world, 
don't just save a dollar, you know, <laughs> like focus on how is this going to actually contribute to the well being of humans, um, the people who are doing the work. As we come in and we're working with RPA processes, we do ask, like, how is this going to make the life better for the employee? What are they going to do with the time that this is going to create? These are important questions to ask and tune into. Um, and if you're interested in really digging into, you know, kind of ethically ethical design for applications, I encourage you to go check out the IEEE 7000 series, which is all about ethically aligned design. And it is an extremely excellent group that is building out some really nice materials and gives you a lot of things to think about. Like, why are we doing this? Is it actually for the good of people? So we talked in general terms around the skills for an AI job. Now, why not specific, specific like this skill? Well, because it depends on the job. Like, you know, what, if you're being a citizen developer in a finance group, that's very different than I want to be a data scientist at Microsoft. You know, so very, very different kind of skill sets that you'd want to focus on. So how do you figure out what skills you should be focusing on? Um, let's talk about where to start. I break it into skills and shouting. So first off, you have skills today. Chances are that you have some kind of skills. How are you going to amplify those skills, you know, to represent what you want to grow into from a career perspective? You know, as I'm saying here, build on what you have, differentiate with who you are. So as an example, um, if you are, I'm going to use the finance person again. So maybe you're um, an intern in a finance team and you are just um, filling out paperwork and doing, you know, filling out an Excel spreadsheet or you're um, scanning invoices that are mailed in from a client um, and saying, okay, here we go. I'll just scan this in. Well, what are the skills that you're using there? Identify them. Because uh, it isn't just, I look at this piece of paper and I type what it says. No, there's probably more to it than that. There's probably some critical thinking that's happening here. And then identify the skills you need to acquire and how do they layer on top of the skills you already have? So for instance, if you are in that intern position where they're just, I just read this document and I start typing on this document um, and into a spreadsheet, you know, copy and paste the data. That's all I'm doing. This would be a great example of, well, RPA can do that. Robotic process automation. It can copy and paste data very easily. So the critical thinking that you've done to say, well, wait a minute, it's not just copy and paste, because if this data is like that, it needs to go in this field. But if the data is different, it goes in this other field. Well, that's critical thinking. And you can build that in as you build more effective RPA bots, because it doesn't have to just be copy, paste, copy, paste. You can build logic into these things. So your critical thinking skills can amplify your RPA developer skills in this particular case. But start with a skill inventory, okay? Um, don't just wing it. So start out with listing the skills that you have. And I mean all the skills. Uh, you know, a, a example I always use is one of the best skills I feel like for the modern workforce is playing Dungeons and Dragons, which I know might sound silly and ridiculous, but if you look at what's really happening in that, you have to work together as a team, usually. <laughs> you have to be able to tell a story, so communication. You have to be able to do some basic math as you are figuring out, like, well, I got to roll dice for this thing, and what's my score, and what modifiers go. There is a lot to these. Now, chances are your average job posting is not going to ask you about your Dungeons & Dragons skills. So you need to be able to translate it to, well, what are the skills that actually matter for this role? But don't just look at your work and say, what am I doing at work and how does that apply? No, look holistically at your whole self and all the stuff that you do. If you have hobbies, look at those hobbies. What are the skills you're using in those hobbies? And if you're not sure what skills that you have or want to build up, go look at LinkedIn. There's tons of people that talk about all kinds of skills on there. Go look around and you might see, oh, I do that. And don't be afraid to say, I do that. 
And if you're still not sure, the US Department of Labor has a uh, excellent resource called ONET Online. And you can go to the US Department of Labor's ONET and look up different jobs, and it'll list all the skills that the US Department of Labor says you need for those jobs. Go look at your job and see what are the skills listed. This is also a great checkpoint to say, I don't do that. Why don't I do that? And you can check in with yourself of, should I be doing that? Or should that be on somebody else? It's a great conversation starter to have in your one-on-one -on -one with your manager. List the skills you want. So remember the whole who and why, Who's, who is this for and why are you doing it? Um, focus on your who, who and why. If you are working um, in a finance department, chances are you do not need to go and learn virtual reality design. You know, you might want to, but does that apply? No, doesn't mean you can't learn it. Go for it, go learn it. Um, but it's, it's, you know, if you wanna focus on generating value for your who, look at the skills that you need to generate value for that who. Uh, two, I would point out on here, systems thinking, super important, especially in artificial intelligence to see an, a thing as a whole. It's not just like this part and that part and that, no, it's, it's a whole, it's a system. And how does, you know, data flow through that system? How does that system work as a system? Very important. Uh, I would also point out influencing without authority. This is a really great topic because again, you're going to be working in teams and you're going to have to convince people that you have a good idea or um, that, hey, we should go in this direction. And it's not always easy to do. So working on skills like influencing without authority, pretty useful uh, and will be a good, good tool to have throughout your career. And finally, so you have a list of your skills. You have a list of the skills that you want to build. Build a list of I will statements. And these are statements to commit to, I will learn this skill. Give yourself a timeline, uh, make it actionable, make it measurable that you can say, yeah, check mark, I did that. And don't get hung up on, well, somebody else has already done this. My example here, tons of apps build business, you know, read business cards. That's, that's a thing that's out there. There's tons of people. It doesn't matter. I'm learning how to do this. What am I really learning here is how to build a power app with computer vision built into it. I'm just going to do business card reader because that's what the tutorial is going to tell, tell you to do. So it's okay to build stuff that people have already built. You're learning. And in fact, you should try to build stuff people have already built because it'll help you learn. And you can ask those people who've already built it, hey, this thing's not working. Why not? and they'll help you. LinkedIn says, these are the skills needed most by companies um, in 2020. My assumption is this was before uh, the pandemic really hit uh, because in those soft skills, I would say resilience needs to be a very high number on that list. You know, as we look at the impact of COVID-19 and how, um, you know, workers go remote, Digital literacy, I would say would be a very important skill. Um, I put digital confidence into that of, okay, well, we're all working remote now. It's like, oh, uh, I, I don't know if I can do that. Oh, that's gonna be really hard. Like I, I have all these problems. I'm calling the help desk all the time. You know, some of this is confidence just of, you can do it. Like I'm telling you, you can do it. So as you also look at these hard skills, you'll notice very tech centric skills here. and. I don't know if that's a reflection of LinkedIn in general, just who is on LinkedIn and how they're using LinkedIn. Um, but I would encourage you to see the analytical reasoning, business analysis. Um, these are very important topics. Um, you know, creativity, persuasion, that's the whole influencing without authority, collaboration, adaptability, emotional intelligence. As I said, put resilience on that list. So you can go and find what are the skills people are looking for out there and, and find and see here's what they mean and look at your existing skills because I think you'll find that the skills you have are probably easily transferable into the new skills you want to build. If they're not, then you can go find videos online to how to do what you want to be able to do. So here's a great example. Um, jobs of the future, reality simulator. This is building virtual worlds for artificial intelligence systems to learn inside of. 
So uh, Boston Dynamics uh, spot the headless dog robot that tends to freak people out, um, but it's a very useful robot. You can train it in the real world, but what is that? It's the sensors are just perceiving the world around it. It can also be trained in a virtual world because to the sensors, it's just different. You know, it's the same input coming in. It's the same ones and zeros. So building out these virtual worlds to train AI systems and robotic systems have a uh, real benefit and value. Now, again, who's doing this work? What are the skills needed for this work? You know, we're really getting into, this is not necessarily an engineer person. This could be an interior designer. This could be a video game designer. Um, the tool that's represented here uh, is Unity Technologies, uh, the Unity game engine. And Unity does amazing work with machine learning and robotics and training within their game design system. Unreal Engine does similar things. But again, these are not uh, tools that you have to be a, this expert engineer to use. You just need to understand the tool. And where can you go learn this? You can go learn all these different tools that you want on YouTube, tons of videos. You know, how do I build a robot in Unity 3D? You will find videos for that. Um, you know, how do I build a virtual world in Unity? You will find videos for that. So very great tools and resources out there. But again, seeing the skills as if you have a hobby that you like to make video games, well, there's a very transferable skill. You can bring that right into reality simulator. Good stuff. It's just knowing that these are the tools that are out there is important. Tell everyone what you're doing and encourage them to tell other people. You know, this is, we are not really as a society, you know, we kind of say, okay, well, I'm going to do this myself. I want to, I want to do this work myself and, you know, grow and bring, bring myself up by my own bootstraps and all that. Yeah, that that's not true. Like you need to work in networks. You need to collaborate with people um, and tell the people what you want to be doing and tell people, you know, here's you know where I'm going professionally and here's how I'm going to get there. You will be shocked at how many people will say, oh, well, I know a person who fill in the blank of what you're trying to do. Um, leverage your network. So tell everybody and go back to, I'm going to jump back here real quick to these I will statements. Tell people those um, because it helps you be accountable because as you tell people, people are going to ask you, so how's that going? And you're going to want to have an answer that's not like, well, I haven't started yet, you know, which gets to LinkedIn as a powerful tool. You can use LinkedIn to share your I will statements um, to your peers, to your network, to say, this is what I'm doing. And tag, if you're talking about any company, tag the company in it. Um, you'll be surprised at how many companies reach out and they're like, oh, try this video or, oh, look at this website. Lots of powerful stuff there. Don't be shy. Tell people what you want to be doing. So I wanted to make sure that I provided a very actionable, like, this is what to do on Monday approach. Um, you know, it's Tuesday. You can do this on Wednesday. It doesn't matter what day it is. So to get to build out the AI job, start with understanding the landscape. You need to know who are the AI influencers in your industry and what is your business doing with AI right now? And expect people to say, well, we're, we're looking into it. That is a very common answer right now. There's a belief that everybody is, um, you know, implementing, every company is implementing AI in every layer. It's not there yet. Um, tech companies are implementing it in all the things that surround us. And so the, earlier in the presentation, I said, it's all around us. And it really is because um, tech companies like Facebook and Apple and Microsoft and Google have put it, and Amazon have put it all around us. But, you know, medium-sized business based out of Baltimore that, you know, they might not be in AI yet. So go and understand where, what's going on right now. Build your res your reskilling plan. We just talked about the skill inventory. Build a plan. How are you going to do those skills? How are you going to learn those skills? You know, how are you going to accomplish your I will statements? Then do it. Don't just build a plan. Make sure you do the plan. 
we just talked about this tell everyone share your plan publish your plan put it on linkedin put it on google drive and send links out to everybody feel free to let people know here's what i'm doing here's where i'm focused and you'll be surprised again i keep saying that but you know i do emphasize this people want you to succeed they will help you one aspect that a lot of people forget is start a project you know don't just learn the skills do the activity do the skill and you know sharpen your tools and get better at the activity don't wait for you to be assigned a project at work to do this just start doing it and you know show people what you're doing share what you're doing you know don't surprise anybody with what you're doing but show this is what i'm doing here's why i'm doing it and have fun you know build up build this to be a fun activity not something that you're like oh i have to do this or or the whole world's gonna end that's not the case you can do it transform your career with artificial intelligence this is a great point in history for you to kind of spark that change with the great reset coming out of covid and you know this whole new world that is being built out it's time for a whole new you that you can address and become the ai expert at your business ai is coming to a job near you it's probably already there um you know you might be using cortana for task management and not even know it so ai is showing up all around us and that's where I really love this quote from Steve Jobs. You know, it's not just about the engineering aspect. There's tons of other skills you need than just engineering skills. So going back to that four step plan, you know, know the landscape, going through and create your reskilling plan, do it, tell everyone what you're doing, do projects and share those projects, work with others, you know, build, be more than, um, you know, just developers, you know, have some passion in it and love what you're doing. And I know it's tough. This is a new field. This is, you know, it's not easy to say, well, I'm going to just be an AI expert now, but it always seems impossible until it's done. And that's, you can do it. You know, this is a, I love this quote from Nelson Mandela. You can do this activity, focus on your skills, use this time to really reset who you are and, and chase the skills that you want to do. So thank you for your time. Jenna, I want to send it back to you. Well, thank you, Tim. I really appreciated the opportunity to learn more about the artificial, artificial intelligence world and to learn um, more about how other um, talents and skills outside of just technology field can be useful. Um, it was It was interesting to learn that. Um, so thank you for your time. Uh, at this moment, we do have some some time available. If anyone has any questions, I'm waiting to see if anything comes through the chat. Uh, attendees today, feel free to put your questions in the chat and direct your questions to everyone. So in the meantime, I'm not seeing anything pop through. A lot of thanks for you, Tim. I think um, you did such a great job. There are just not a whole lot of questions at this moment, but if anyone on um, this event has more questions for Tim, please feel free to reach out to me or send me um, an email and I can make the connection between you and Tim. Um, so Tim, thank you again for joining us and leading us through this webinar. Um, I'd like to ask all of our guests today to mark your calendars for April 26th. 21st. On this date, Tigers around the world will celebrate TU through our third annual TU Big Give. TU Big Give is a university-wide 24-hour online fundraising challenge where donors give back to the areas of TU that mean the most to them, from scholarships, academic and athletic programs, to emergency funds, hands-on learning opportunities, and so much more. We ask that you consider joining us to strengthen our TU community. More details will be shared about this in the coming weeks. We hope you can join us for some of our other upcoming events. Next week on March 30th, TU archivist Felicity Knox will be joining us for a webinar on influential women in TU's history. On April 7th, our TU Business and Leadership Alumni Alliance is hosting a special webinar on navigating your career search, which is geared towards recent and soon to be TU graduates. Uh, then on April 13th, we will be hosting an informative, informative session on the ins and outs of car buying with our very own TU alumnus, Jason Goldsmith, CEO and co-founder of Car Checks. You can register and learn more about these events at alumni.towson.edu slash events. 
Make sure you follow the TEU Alumni Association on our social media channels and on Tiger Connect, which is our online alumni community. These details are now in your window. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. We do hope to see you next time. Have a great day.